Hey everyone, welcome to episode 9 of the Economic Forces Podcast. I'm Brian Albrecht of the International Center for Law and Economics. I'm with Josh Hendrickson, as always, he's at Ole Miss. We're talking about price theory today. Uh, this podcast is our monthly supplement to our newsletter, which you can find at, at pricetheory.substack.com. Uh, who are we talking with today, Josh? So today's guest is Garrett Scott. Uh, Garrett just recently defended his dissertation at uh, North Carolina, and so uh, he's going to be joining Ole Miss uh, this fall. And so we wanted to talk to him today about uh, his work and sort of how it relates to our interests in price theory and things like that. So we normally start out with kind of a question about you. So like how um, did you end up working uh, in I.O. and how um, and, and how did you get involved working on this particular project? Yeah, it's, it's great to be here, guys. Um, you know, the thing that kind of led me to I.O., I would say, is, is you know, taking a game theory course as an undergrad. Um, you know, I was, I was kind of leaning towards the math route, at least at that point. Um, and then I took, you know, this game theory course my junior year. It was actually the first time I thought about taking more econ classes. Um, you know, I, I wanted to ultimately take metrics, but then, uh, you know, after that class, I, I also started thinking about, you know, potentially going to a PhD program. So um, that was kind of the first time I really thought about IO itself. Um, and then ultimately I ended up here at UNC. Um, I again took all these IO courses in my second year. I, I really liked the faculty here, um, including my advisor, John Williams, who has done a lot of airline related work. Um, so ultimately, you know, he, he kind of told me based on my interests, which are, are really related in to, uh, you know, how consumers make these dynamic decisions and how, you know, these firms are potentially making dynamic decisions as well in regards to prices um, and said that the airline industry is a, a great place to examine those sort of questions. So, you know, ultimately uh, we started working with this airline about two or three years ago. Um, and it's kind of been this ongoing collaboration now, uh, work with, on them with a variety of projects, um, from auctions to, you know, forecasting to de demands for, for these airline tickets. Um, and most recently we've been helping them kind of think about individual prices a little bit and, and how they're dealing with these, uh, consumers who have, you know, different characteristics, um, kind of break that mold of the way they, they set prices right now. One of the really cool things to me about about IO as a field, even though I'm, I'm a little bit removed from it, is just this interesting interplay between theory and empirics. I know it mm -hmm. seems like a field that theory is still very much applied theory has has a lot of traction in a way that other fields may, you know, it's not quite as sexy right now. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about you brought the game theory course, you know, kind of how how you think about theory's role in in studying industrial organization. Yeah, I mean, I have I have two theorists on my committee, so mm -hmm. you know, I would uh, uh, be very cautious in, in saying I don't think about theory at all. I actually think about it quite a bit. Um, you know, a lot of of the way I think about different issues is, as far as I study them, I have to do a lot with what I've seen um, from those two people, Gary Bigleiser and and Fei Li. Um, you know. In particular, Faye has this paper that I like to think inspired my job market paper in which, you know, he is thinking about this sort of scenario where a firm has a limited capacity of goods um, and, and they need to allocate those dynamically over time. Um, and, you know, obviously he is a theorist. He thought about this from the theory perspective. He has this really nice model. Um, I tried to adapt that model. Obviously, I need to take it to the data. Um, and, and in that regard, you know, my model is not nearly as sophisticated. But, um, you know, it definitely uh, is something that I constantly think about. Obviously, us as consumers, um, you know, we're making these decisions with our, our utility in mind and, 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 you know, that sort of thing. So um, it plays a heavy role in how I decide to model my consumers um, and, and the way they think about things dynamically. So your papers on airlines, you said how you, you know you got the data. Why are airlines? Before we get into your your paper, particularly, why are airlines uh, 
something of interest. Because if I read an I.O. paper at random, it seems like it's either cement, cereal, or airlines. Why airlines? Who cares? What's interesting about them? Yeah, I, I think from my perspective, I am interested in, in like these dynamic interactions between the consumers and firms. Um, initially, when I went and, and kind of presented, you know, some early stage ideas, I was really thinking in mind, um, like these resale markets for sports tickets, um, you know, and obviously that's kind of a difficult place to get data as well. Um, but, you know, the airline industry is a place where I think data collection is, is I think, getting a lot better, um, similar to resale markets, I guess. But that ability to kind of see prices change over time, um, potentially see consumers make these decisions over time. Um, I think that is why, in particular, the airline industry is interesting to me. Believe me, when I started out, um, I had no idea exactly how airlines priced. I didn't think I would ever know. I didn't think I would care. Um, but it actually is a very, very interesting place, I think, because of the fact that, um, you know, this is a decision that um, it, it's it's really difficult to wrap your head around at times. And it seems difficult for the airline itself, too. Like, um, they're constantly, you know, working on, how best to price, you know, how best to allocate these goods, um, not just for a single flight, but across flights as well. Um, so I think that's what makes this, you know, like a really interesting territory to study these dynamic decisions. And I think too, the, um, so your job market paper kind of gets into something that like we love to talk about uh, here, which is pricing decisions. And so, um, you know, you're looking at airlines. Um, but this is kind of interesting to me because airlines are kind of selling something different than um, than like the typical good, right? Because if I'm buying a flight, I have to buy that flight ahead of time. So I'm paying for something now that I'm not going to use until some point in the future. So maybe you could talk a little bit about like what role that plays in kind of thinking about consumer decisions and, and also thinking about kind of um, how airlines, you know, think about that degree of uncertainty when they're setting their prices. Yeah, I mean, you hit on it exactly, I think. Um, that gap between when you buy and when you actually use your ticket um, leads to potentially quite a bit of uncertainty. And it could be, you know, just um, related to the flight. Um, it could be related to a million other things, right? Like, you may get sick, you know, it's COVID, you may not be able to take it for that reason. Um, or, you know, your plans might completely change uh, business meeting, all kinds of things like that. Um, which I think is what makes this even more interesting because consumers are thinking about that uncertainty when they're making their decision, right? And airlines also understand that consumers have varying degrees of uncertainty. That's why, um, you know, in, in my paper, you know, I, I rely heavily on the fact that the airline is offering different tickets that have to do with that uncertainty, right? They're, they might have differences in terms of, you know, rewards points and that sort of thing, but also they're potentially very different in how they can be refunded. Um, so I think it, it just adds like another layer of discrimination, right? Um, you know, consumers are arriving at different times. They have, you know, different levels of utility that they can get from different aspects of the ticket. Um, but just kind of in the background, something that we haven't really been able to tease out in the airline papers is that uncertainty. Um, and I think this data is like the stepping stone to potentially seeing that, um, which is like really exciting, obviously, for, for this work. So in addition to uncertainty, what are kind of the, the general way you think about the bundle of attributes that makes up an airline ticket? What else matters for uh, you know anything that you know may doesn't come to mind for just the casual consumer of you know user of airline tickets yeah i think part of it actually has to do with the airline's objective too um the airline is trying to bring in repeat customers right like they're trying to survive off these consumers who come back um time and time again so one feature of the ticket is rewards points potentially right um they want to build this loyal customer base 
Um, and when I, what I see here in the data is, is that, uh, you know, there are quite a few people who select tickets that are pretty similar. And the only real difference is that, you know, one has these rewards points available to them. Um, so that's, you know, one aspect. Another is potentially these ancillary fees. Um, so in addition to cancellation fees, you know, you might be willing to pay a little bit more so that you can select your seat on the flight. Or, you know, you might be willing to pay a little bit more so that you don't have to uh, pay for a checked bag or two checked bags, whatever it may be, right? So um, there are quite a few differences within tickets within a cabin. Then we can get into discussions about different cabins, right? Like people might be willing to pay more to have bigger space, sit in first class, comfy chair, whatever it may be. Um, and I think that the airline understands that quite well, right? Like this is, is something that, um, you know, they seem to, to, you know, have this menu in mind uh, with all of these different characteristics, not just uh, refundability, obviously, but, but all these different characteristics that, that could you know, appease these different types of consumers. We've talked about this on the podcast and written and written a few newsletters about kind of this role of brand loyalty. The lo uh, the reward points is an extreme version, like an actual measurable version, right? You get to the extent people are willing to pay to hold on to these reward points, show some sort of loyalty to it. And it seems like for the airlines, like that's something that not just the reward points, but this brand, this repeat customers is really huge you know everyone has that that one airline that they refuse to fly on everyone that flies regularly because they had you know a terrible experience right it's such a the transaction is so much more than just this you give me the apple i give you the money end of transaction uh, it's but how do you outside of reward points how do you I mean, how else to do related to your paper or, or things you think about more generally, how else do, what other role does this repeated dealings play for this, for these markets? Well, I mean, in particular, you know, we could get into discussions here about, um, you know, one of the things that we're working on a little bit more recently is, is potentially how to, uh, uh, you know, kind of create some sort of benefit to them in, in different ways, these repeat customers. Um, so, you know, I mentioned a little bit ago, we've done some work on, you know, auctions with this airline. So the idea that you can kind of like show up, um, buy an economy ticket and then make a bid for, you know, a premium or a first class ticket later on. Um, and what we see actually is this airline kind of made this decision when they introduced this type of auction to basically create some sort of bump for these tickets that are, or for these consumers that have higher loyalty statuses. Um, so for instance, if I'm the highest loyalty status, um, I could bid a hundred dollars, but essentially I get some 25% bump that makes my bid of a hundred dollars worth $125. Um, and you may have, you know, no loyalty status at all. Um, you may bid $110 um, and you get no bump. So what ultimately happens is I, get the ticket to move into first class, uh, despite this fact that you actually are willing to pay more for that ticket. Um, so, you know, these types of things, in addition to complimentary upgrades, right? Like all airlines kind of do this as well. Um, people with these high loyalty tier statuses can kind of show up at the gate and, and just get bumped up for free potentially. Um, so I think that this is something that, that they think about a lot. Um, and also not even thinking about loyalty statuses, but you know, one thing I found in the data is that people are canceling this ticket that's non-refundable. And I went to the airline guys and I was like, you know, why do I see this? There's no reason for anyone to cancel this ticket. They're not getting anything back. And the response I got was, well, you know, ultimately, you know, we care that these consumers come back to us. So, you know, there might be specific circumstances where they call in and say things like, oh, this, I never anticipated this, you know. Um, they might be willing to actually comp them some sort of money because they reached out and they want that consumer to ultimately come back. So um, it, it makes their problem really interesting from, you know, the econometrician's standpoint. Um, it's not exactly always clear what their objective is, right? Like you want to say, oh, they're trying to maximize the, the profits from this flight, but it, it's this flight, it's 
all the flights for the next month, the next quarter, the next year, um, which is why I think that uh, you know a lot of these these models that we've seen in which we care a lot about um, how they're setting prices. You know, it's not always clear that that's the best model. Um, so I think that the the fact that I have you know this uh, this really intricate consumer side. I'm trying to tease out kind of these decisions um, and and, and uh, the way consumers think is really important to also getting at what the airline is trying to do and how they can ultimately optimize their own decisions. Well, and I think too, like the thing about airlines that's kind of interesting is they're sort of balancing this objective. These are things like we talk about um, in the newsletter all the time or things like... Um, you know, price discrimination can make people better off, right? Um, but in some ways, uh, consumers might not necessarily be happy with that because, like, you know, some of these consumers are having their surplus extracted. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and so, like, socially, this can make thing make you know people better off. But like on an individual basis, the consumer might not be better off and so like you know if you're if the airlines charging everybody for the pillow or whatever uh on their flight then you know people might get upset about that sort of thing and then and airlines have to care about this because they have because what they really care about is not just um you know like so many times we talk about price discrimination we're thinking about once and for all decisions and so like oh i charge you this price this one time but in reality you want these people to keep coming back and flying with you over and over again. And in that case, you know, you got to be careful about these sort of forms of price discrimination that might kind of extract surplus from the consumer. And you, and you don't have the, like the idea of, okay, I'm buying the Apple. I'm a high demand person for the Apple. I'm always going to be a high demand person for the Apple, right? What's interesting about this case, yes, there are people who are business travelers that are consistently different. But a lot of people kind of alternate. Sometimes they have a lot of flexibility. Sometimes they don't. You know, so I might show up tomorrow and be the one that could be extracted from a lot more because I'm, I'm willing to pay because it's a work trip. But I have a bad taste in my mouth from, you know, when I traveled with my family. It's a, you know, not that that's easy to tease out from the econometrician's point of view, but it's, it's super interesting in terms of you know, the actual pricing problem that you're trying to get at as the econometrician. Yeah, and I think... Um... You know, just to uh, kind of break into a little history of, of the way these airlines are pricing, you know, um, they're a little bit handicapped currently because there's this strict fare class system, right? So for the economy cabin, um, basically every airline has these set fares, right? And basically the way it works is um, you got this one group on in that airline that's, you know, saying, okay, we're willing to release so many tickets from this fair class. And this other group that's saying, okay, this is the price for that fair class. And this is uniform across all of the airlines. Um, and basically the reason why this is uniform is because there is some sort of, um, you know, group that collects all this data and has all of these things tracked and everyone needs to have the same, the same fair class structure. And in talking to the airline, they actually kind of want to break away from this a little bit because it's really restrictive. Essentially what it does is it makes their supply curve a step function, right? Um, and they would obviously like to price things a, a, a little bit more along, you know, the smooth demand curve. Um, so one thing that they're really trying to elicit, it seems, is to get at this information about consumers in which they will price these things kind of individually. You will be able to say, okay, I'm willing to pay this much for a pillow or this much so that I don't have to check a bag or this much so I can select a seat. I think that's where they want to go um, based on discussions with them. It's just difficult right now because every airline has to follow this kind of rigid fair class structure. This is a regulatory restriction? Yeah. How, how granular is it? Do they like, because it seems uh, from my perspective, I like, it seems like there's a ton of price discrimination. We got dynamics, you know, all this stuff. What, mm -hmm. what are the sets in which can you go so, a little more into that detail? I think in, in the economy class, they have at least like 10 fair classes. Um, and, you know, this is something uh, you can kind of look up. It's like 
um, you have all these different letters, right? It's like E and J and K, like all of these things represent all of these fare classes. For economy, they have some for premium first class as well. Um, but basically there is some flexibility from these two different groups that I mentioned. So one group is kind of in control of, okay, well, this fare class is open on this day. And then this other group has some flexibility as to like the price we want to set for that specific fare class. Wait, right? This so is these, a group within the regulatory this is a group within the airline. It was so, in the airline. Yeah, so in the revenue yeah. management system, right? right? They have this group that kind of controls the fare classes, this group that controls the pricing as well. Um, and at times, it seems like they don't even work together all that well. Um, uh, I think they're getting a little bit more sophisticated. Uh, so one thing I noticed, I have access to data um, going back a few years, and there's like this discrete jump when I think they improved their revenue management is to as far as like how well they were actually allocating seats on planes, like their load factors change drastically um, and that sort of thing. So, yeah, it, it's really I interesting. Think, uh, that blows my mind. I, I didn't realize that there were the two. I knew there was regulations on that side. I didn't realize then internally uh, we had this kind of it's kind of like think, monetary and fiscal policy not working together. Right. Yeah, I think they're getting a little bit more towards um, like kind of like these guided revenue management systems, like some some sort of actual, uh, you know, like uh, coding and AI involved in how, like something that says, okay, this is how many tickets we should have based on the demand that we've seen for this flight and historically. Um, but it seems like at one point, you know, these groups were kind of making their own decisions and, and obviously that wasn't the best for the airline. Um, but yeah, I think that's 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 really interesting as far as like the future of this industry goes. Um, you know, whether we can actually see kind of what they want to do as far as like individual pricing, almost they're they're just not there yet as far as capabilities. Yeah, so we've been kind of talking about airline prices uh, and airline pricing sort of generally, but so why don't you tell us a little bit about kind of like what your job market paper is about and how it kind of gets at these these issues. Yeah, so in my job market paper, I'm obviously thinking about, um, you know, screening with different tickets. Um, essentially, I'm going to be using this interesting data from this airline uh, to, to get at how they're making these decisions over time, how consumers are making their decisions over time. Um, and ultimately, what I have here is a model in which, you know, consumers they arrive, they observe all their choices that are given to them by the airline. This is this includes, you know, which ticket is available for them. Um, also, the prices that they see, they can then kind of form some expectation about the way prices evolve over time. And basically, um, I take like the Google flights approach here. I use all of this historical data that kind of builds their their idea of the way prices will evolve over time. Um, and the Google flight approach, you mean that they say like, oh, this flight is average, this flight is more than average when you yeah, search them? Yeah, like Google flights essentially will say, oh, this is a great time to book right now, right? So what I have here is, you know, consumers think about prices evolving according to like a Markov matrix. Um, so similar to this idea that, you know, there are these strict fare classes that exist, I kind of set these different price states. Right. And you see what price state you're in when you arrive to the market. And based on you know all this historical data that I have, similar to Google Flights, you can anticipate where prices are going to go in the future, you know, extending off until the flight takes off. Um, so, you know, in this regard, unlike a lot of papers that have to do with the airline industry, in which we really think carefully about the way prices evolve dynamically. Um, I'm actually allowing consumers to behave dynamically, which is um, something that isn't very common in the literature. Um, I can think of two papers off the top of my head um, in which consumers do have this ability to you know, show up and, and wait potentially. Um, but it's one of those things where we have to kind of really measure how sophisticated we want the different sides to be. Um, I'm kind of taking a, 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 a nonchalant stance on the way the airline's setting the prices um, because I'm thinking a little bit more carefully about uh, the way the consumers are making their decisions over time. So obviously they have this ability to, you know, see the menu, make some expectation about it, 
And they're ultimately going to decide whether they want to buy the ticket today or wait until tomorrow and make that decision all over again. So what's the uncertainty besides the evolution of price? Why, why are these, why do these customers differ in a, in another metric in which ultimately would be the way in which you discriminate against them as the airline? Yeah. So consumers can be discriminated in two ways, basically in my model. So one is they have different values for tickets and also they have different values for quality. So for instance, the highest quality ticket um, comes with, you know, rewards points, no ancillary fees, a full refund if they decide to cancel. And basically the lowest quality ticket has none of that. Um, so consumers differ in their willingness to pay and the way in which shocks might arrive to them after purchase. So that's another unique thing here about my model in particular is the decision isn't over per se when they make the decision to buy. Um, after they buy, there are these shocks that could arrive to them. And basically I'm trying to uh, model those shocks with the data that I see on cancellations. Um, so there are a few interesting things that really come out of the data here. Um, and, and a lot of them have to do, I think, with regulatory stances by the, the DOT. So the DOT has this policy that says any cancellation made within 24 hours of purchase um, is fully refundable, regardless of what ticket you buy. Um, so for instance, I see about half of my cancellations happening within 24 hours, and they come across all of these different ticket classes um, from the non-refundable ones to the fully refundable ones. Um, and then ultimately, I kind of see that cancellations sort of die off as time goes on. Um, so, you know, consumers, they understand that there's some benefit potentially to waiting because they become less uncertain over time. However, they also know that in the airline industry, prices rise on average over time. And that's anecdotally and that's seen in the data as well. So we can really form this optimal stopping problem of the consumer. How long do I want to wait getting more certain over time? but also understanding that prices are rising over time. Um, so there's essentially going to be the sweet spot for the consumer of where you know, they'll actually buy the ticket because they see no more value in waiting to have that risk of the higher price ticket later. Okay, so you said a bunch of people cancel within the first 24 hours. That's not different by, by class because that's, that's regulated. You know, how many people are canceling at at different times, how long do they wait on average? How long out are they purchasing? Like, you know, how much uncertainty really is there? Or do most people look I don't know, six months in advance, three months in advance? What kind of give me a sense of the timing on both the purchases and the and the uh, cancellations when they do happen? Yeah. So, uh, you know, basically, what the airline does is they're going to make tickets available eleven months in advance. Um, it kind of depends on the market, of course. So for international flights, you know, people are obviously making this big decision. It might be a vacation decision, something like that. They need to make sure they have all of these components together, hotel, all of these types of things. Um, they tend to make decisions a lot earlier. Um, so we're talking, you know, five, six months in advance. Um, when it comes to domestic flights, it's oftentimes, you know, a lot closer to departure. Um, I see most of those purchases made in the last month or so. Um, and actually, this is kind of funny. You know, someone uh, always asks anytime I talk about, you know, the airline industry is, you know, like, when should I buy? Like, what day of the week? You know, what time? All of these sorts of things. Um, when it comes to especially like domestic tickets, uh, the airline is really uncertain far away. Just like consumers are uncertain, the airline's uncertain as to what demand is actually going to look like. Um, so I've actually been told that if you're buying a ticket on a domestic flight, you should probably think about buying three to two months before you actually decide to go on the flight. And this is mostly because they need some time to understand where consumers are at. And early on, you might see a really low price, right? Like six months in advance, you might see a really low price. However, you might see a price that's actually too high, right? So if there are a lot of days in which consumers aren't buying early on, that's kind of a signal that, hey, our prices are too high, we actually need to drop them. Um, so the sweet spot to kind of buy is, it seems to be in that three to two month mark. Um, most of them buy in the last month or so. Uh, when it comes to cancellations, uh, I do see quite a few people just cancel shortly after they purchase. 
Um, and this has a lot to do with that DOT regulation. Um, I also see that, you know, sometimes people kind of wait until the very end as well. So there are sometimes bumps at the end as far as cancellations go. Um, and I think that most of these are like the highest economy ticket consumer um, because of the fact that they can cancel at any time before departure and get a full refund. Um, but for the most part, you know, consumers want their money back, right? They want to be able to spend it on, you know, a different flight or something like that. So they tend to cancel um, fairly close to their purchase date. So I'm going to say a term I don't think I've ever said on the podcast or the newsletter, but I hear other economists use it, identification. So I hear identification is a big thing. I don't know anything about it. I'm a theorist. But uh, what's the fundamental identification problem in this setting for you looking at consumers and how do you get around it? Yeah, so here, consumers kind of differ in six variables in my model, okay? So some of them govern their willingness to pay. I'm obviously going to rely on the prices I observe, right? Those are gonna tell me a lot about your willingness to pay as a consumer. I also have parameters that govern the uncertainty they have. And I observe cancellations, which allows me to kind of identify these parameters. Um, additionally, I have, you know, this parameter that governs your risk aversion as a consumer. And, you know, this is kind of an interesting parameter to think about, but the way I like to think about it is, um, the more risk averse you are, the more likely you are to buy one of these higher class tickets, that's going to offer you a lot more protection, right? So the class of ticket is going to inform me quite a bit about consumers risk aversion. And similarly, I also think about when consumers arrive to the market. And I would say that this is a parameter in which I have probably the least amount of information on. Um, in the data that I'm using in this paper, I know nothing about when consumers search for tickets. Um, I actually have this data um, in more recent you know, versions of the data that have been given to me. Um, but the way I like to think about this is in addition to uh, you know, the types of tickets that are being bought, um, when you buy a ticket is really informative as to when you arrive too, right? And the way the prices are evolving over time. So if you arrive really early um, and you think that prices are gonna be relatively stable for a while, you might hang around, right? You might wait and see what happens. You're becoming more certain over time. Um, but obviously if you're arriving really early and you know prices are really volatile, you might wanna go ahead and buy right when you arrive. So. That's kind of how I think about identification. Those last two parameters, I know, um, you know, they're they're really difficult to think about in the context of the data that I have. Um, so I definitely lean heavy on these various moments that I can observe in my data. So one of the things that I'm kind of thinking about here is that you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but airline prices go up the closer to the flight, right? But hotel prices seem to go down closer to the date right and so part of my question is like why why is that the case but then the other thing is is if you're thinking about cancellation um it's kind of related to this first point and what i mean by that is is that um part of the reason you want the option to cancel is that you don't want to wait to the last minute but the reason you don't want to wait to the last minute is you might pay a higher price but if i'm paying a higher price for cancellation so like what's what's my incentive to buy the ticket with the cancellation option versus waiting like do we have a sense of like how those prices differ and like and is this kind of relate and is this at all related to that first observation which may or may not be empirically correct but we're we don't we don't do empirics. that's not that's not important for this podcast we're not, not gonna worry about the empirical correctness of our claims Okay, so hold on. Let me let me make sure I can wrap my head around your question that you're asking. Um, so the first point was kind of you know, airline tickets seem to rise over time, and hotels seem to decline over time. I think this has a little bit to do with um, the cost structure of these two things, like the the marginal cost of actually putting someone um, in an, a seat or you know in a hotel room. Um, but basically the way I like to think about it is prices are rising over time because the composition of travelers 
is said to be changing over time, right? Someone who arrives close to departure, um, they're probably willing to pay a lot more for the seat. Um, and there's this issue of, um, for the airline at least, they want to be really careful about dropping the price, even if their load factor is really low, right? Because we've already hit on this idea of repeat customers. If I'm someone who, um, you know, knows that the airline's going to drop the price because there are some empty seats at the end, I'll always wait, right? So they're really reluctant to drop the seat at the or the, to drop the price at the end. Um, I think when it comes to hotels, especially, uh, that's not a big of an issue for them, right? Because um, I. I don't have data on this, but I don't think that hotels are nearly as close to capacity. I know it sometimes they are, um, but just like the nature of hotels, I think I know John Rust is going to come into this podcast and, and he has all this data and he'll, he would kind of rip that as, uh, assertion apart. But um, yeah, I, I just think the the nature of the item itself, um, in addition to, I know that hotels have this sort of um less rigid cancellation fee structure right like you can cancel a hotel room up to 24 hours before you actually get into it and you get a full refund um and i actually have some data on hotel cancellations it's like nearly 40 percent of hotel rooms are actually canceled after they're booked um, and i think both these things kind of work together they probably have a ridiculous number of cancellations close to you know the time that consumers actually enter the hotel room. And in this case, they're tr probably trying to offload some, some rooms there close to, to the, to the debate, but yeah, that was the first part. The second part you were asking about, you might have to remind me about that one. Yeah. So the second part is, is like, okay, if the prices are rising, uh -huh. um, as we get closer to the flight, well, if I'm worried that I'm going to have to cancel, um, I seem to have two options, right? I can book now mm -hmm. and then maybe pay a little bit extra for the right to cancel. Mm -hmm. Or I can just continue to wait to the last minute and um, just, yeah, I'll have to pay a slightly higher price. Um, but I guess what I'm asking is, is like, how do you, how do you navigate the, the trade-off? Is it all just risk aversion? Like I'd rather pay like, this price now like because i know it with certainty then wait or, or is there something else going on well i think there are a few things going on here um i'm allowing consumers to have some sort of expectation that tickets aren't available too um which also goes to this point i was making just a second ago like if you're a consumer um who really wants to get on a flight and, and you know you might have some uncertainty but the ticket you want has the potential of being not available. Like I see um, nearly 25% of this cheap economy one ticket is unavailable in the last week, right? If that's the only ticket you have a willingness to pay for, you're gonna buy it at that time, right? Um, and you're probably not willing to wait until you know that price is, or that ticket's potentially gone and you have to pay a much higher price. Um, so there is that trade-off obviously of, um, you know, how long am I willing to wait before the price gets too high? Um, which is something that the consumers in my model, they're definitely thinking about. Um, and obviously that's going to drive that timing decision, right? There are consumers that obviously wait until the last day. Um, and that could be, uh, I think it's more linked to their willingness to pay. They just have this high willingness to pay. Uh, whereas, you know, I could probably incorporate this idea that consumers actually take some loss if they don't get on the flight, right? That could potentially explain something there as well. I don't have that in my model. I don't know how, speaking of identification, I don't know exactly how I would identify that um, with the data I have at least, but yeah, there's definitely this trade-off that's driven by, you know, the, the fact that some tickets just will not be available close to departure. Well, it, it, luckily for you, your 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 new chair has done some work on options and and thinking about this dynamic pricing. So maybe we can get some theory work, some more theory work in there. Uh, I I want to go a little bit to the the welfare implications of of price discrimination in general. It's something that is interesting to 
I, I teach it in you know principles of micro. I think it's one of the counterintuitive things that, oh, when you're able to price discriminate, welfare can go up. And it may not. There's lots of reasons it doesn't go up. Um, you say a few times in your paper that the initial allocations of goods is suboptimal. What do you mean by by the initial allocation and which which sense is it is it suboptimal? So in some ways, I think it's suboptimal potentially because we have these consumers who are paying for something that they ultimately will not need, right? Like they decide to cancel the ticket and because they're buying tickets that have some sort of cancellation fee, they're essentially paying for nothing, right? Um, so what I attempt to do in some counterfactual analyses is think about reducing that cost to them. For those that do cancel these tickets um, that you know have some sort of cancellation fee attached to it, let's reduce that and see what happens. Um, and I want to be upfront here. I'm kind of taking this approach to um, you know the way prices evolve over time. I'm saying that it's held constant from before. And obviously, you know when we think about the airline industry, they're probably taking the cancellation fee into consideration when they're setting prices. Um, so the way they set prices might change slightly. Um, it's pretty interesting. Obviously, when COVID happened, um, all tickets became fully refundable. That was something that all airlines decided to do. And what I found is that prices weren't all that much different um, in that time when all tickets were fully refundable than they were um, prior to that, which, uh, you know, again, leads me to, to question kind of the way they set prices a little bit here. but. Um, you know, obviously, if we incorporate some sort of relaxation of cancellation fees, you might think that the price might increase. Um, but that aside, what we have here are, you know, these reductions in cancellation fees. And when those happen, consumers are actually going to potentially change their decisions, right? So if I say that this ticket is going to have a lower cancellation fee, I might shift my decision from this really expensive ticket that comes with a full refund to this now cheaper ticket that has better protection than it did previously right so in this sense um consumers tend to be better off for two reasons they're shifting from expensive tickets to cheaper tickets right so the price they're effectively paying up front is less also when it comes to cancellations their average cancellation fee is less if they need to cancel. So consumers, ultimately, they're better off. However, for the airline, they're missing out on that more expensive ticket, right? Like no one's, or fewer people are buying that more expensive ticket now. In addition, they're getting less money from the cancellation fees on average. Um, so in this regard, their profits are taking, you know, a big hit as well, just like consumers, consumer welfare is increasing. Um, one thing that, I found interesting is that the percentage of consumers that actually buy tickets isn't changing all that much. Um, it actually might be slightly decreasing because consumers are kind of waiting around more as time goes on because they know that they can get this ticket later at a, at a more relaxed cancellation fee. And sometimes they wait themselves out of the market because the price rise is too high for them. Um, so, you know, this kind of interesting effect happens of, um, consumer welfare increases slightly, um, but the profits actually take a bigger hit here. And that's why I make that statement of kind of if we hold the price process as it is, um, the total welfare actually will fall slightly here. So in the standard screening problem, you know, you have a high type that's willing to pay a lot of low type. The distortion that comes in is that you kind of you make the low types item a little less attractive so that the, the guy that's willing to pay a lot doesn't want to do that and mm -hmm. you, know, you make in the story that we tell you know in the simple example is you you know you make the knee you have too little knee room uh in the economy class and therefore you the people who have enough money for for uh first class or or business class don't decide to you know get the the, the cheaper ticket and so the just to make sure I'm clear on the what you're doing, what you're doing is kind of mechanically making the by by reducing the cancellation fee, you're mechanically making the um, bad choice better. Better, yeah. Which 
hurts the sorting function. Right? Mm -hmm. So we, I mean, maybe maybe it's obvious once you've explained it. It wasn't obvious the first time I, I read it, definitely either. But so it, it, if firms are are setting prices somewhat optimally, that seems to be what you'd expect, right? You're you're if they start in a world in which they're screening optimally or doing mm -hmm. a good job at that, and you're you're forcing them to do worse. Well, we'd expect uh, their profits to fall, um, and probably maybe overall welfare to fall. So it's it for a naive theorist like myself, it seems fairly plausible. Yeah, and I think an, a really interesting thing that you just hit on as well is I, one of the things that I think drives this decision by airlines, especially, and why they're really comfortable with this kind of uh, discriminatory discriminatory tactic that they use right now of kind of like bad ticket, bad refunds, medium ticket, medium refund, high ticket, full refund, like that sort of thing, is that anecdote, that anecdotal evidence of the business traveler who has a high willingness to pay and high uncertainty versus the leisure traveler who you know has this uh, low uncertainty, low willingness to pay, this structure seems to fit really well with that, like high type, low type, let's just make these tickets, these nice steps. Um, one thing that I actually have found kind of in more recent work related to this is that in these markets where there aren't these rigid like high types and low types, meaning there seems to be more heterogeneity in the way uncertainty and willingness to pay actually interact, um, they do a lot better job uh, in the types of markets where there's this uh, you know more strict heterogeneity, these different types, right? Um, so I think that part of the issue here, part of the reason why, you know, potentially we could have some problems with the, the way they're using these discriminatory, ta discriminatory tactics um, is the heterogeneity just might not be exactly what they think, um, which ultimately, you know, that's part of what I would like to explore more in this paper potentially is, is you know, looking at how much do we actually give up by using these kind of strict levels. Um, one thing that I've actually done and another counterfactual that hasn't made it into the paper quite yet um, is, you know, bringing in first degree price discrimination. So I'm going to give you the ticket at exactly your value and you can get a full refund. OK, and this actually gets at that thing that they're trying to do more recently of individual pricing. Um, and what I see is that consumer welfare is a lot better off if or not consumer welfare, but total welfare is a lot better off in these markets um, where there's a lot of heterogeneity and uncertainty and willingness to pay when we can first degree price discriminate. Well, and I think this makes sense because if you think about it, um, if all we really care about, like, like if all, if the only thing that, that separates consumers is like how concerned they are about whether or not they're going to have to cancel, right? So like, um, if we get relative prices right, then, you know, the people who are risk averse and concerned about canceling, they're all going to pay the higher price. And, um, and then the people who aren't as risk averse, they're all just going to pay the lower price. And so we get this separating equilibrium from these relative prices. The problem is, is that they differ on a lot of other, uh, uh, other characteristics. So like if I'm a business traveler, I might not even be paying right for my ticket I get that that um you know my my employer might be paying for the ticket and so in that case i might have a high willingness to pay because i don't care how much my employer pays right or at least to some extent um so there's like a uh so there's that aspect and so then once you incorporate that then it sort of makes this scenario messier because what you're charging people for is risk aversion but one of the people who's willing to pay a lot is not paying a lot because of risk aversion they're paying a lot because they're not like the it's like a principal agent problem right like they're not the one who's really paying for the for the good and what this got me kind of thinking about is like um you see these like third party like insurance schemes and things like that associated with tickets where it's like oh hey you bought your ticket now that you've bought your ticket do you want to enroll in this um you know insurance uh, scheme where you pay us some amount of money today and if you have to cancel then like we'll we will give you the refund right so like the the 
airline still gets paid, but you'll get your money back. And so um, how well do these third party kind of insurance schemes work? I don't know. Maybe you don't know the answer, but like how well do they work? And then, um, and as you know, and if you have a sufficient amount of heterogeneity, to what extent are these kinds of options helpful for the airline? Yeah, so this is something that's come up a few times um, in talking about this paper. So I actually don't have a lot of information as far as data goes on on these third party mechanisms of, of insurance here. Um, I will say I have some anecdotal evidence. Again, uh, you know, this comes from, you know. Sufficient for this podcast. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, plenty sufficient. Yeah. Yeah. Wild, wild speculation is all we're after. Yeah. I, I honestly think that consumers tend to be more reluctant to, to, you know, enter into these sorts of third party insurance mechanisms, um, in particular, because of the fact that one, the airline is already offering them a form of insurance through the refund. Um, and two, uh, you know, there are all these stories about how your money kind of gets locked up once you actually do have to cancel like do you get it back as travel credit or you know how exactly is it being returned to you um so i don't have good information on the number of people that actually select into you know the third party insurance um i will say that it is a pretty interesting problem to think about right um because i think the thing that makes the airlines problem you know worthwhile is that it is different than you know, a lot of these other types of insurance that we do see. Um, it's not third party. It's literally the provider is also providing the insurance. Um, but this also gets at ideas of, you know, like resale and things like that, potentially, right? Like other forms of insurance that could be worthwhile in this setting. Um, there has been some work on thinking about resale in particular in the airline industry. Um, obviously, it's, it's not legal at this point because of security reasons, but um, I think that we kind of see improvements in total welfare if consumers are able to resell or resell tickets. Um, but yeah, not a lot of information on like, you know, the clickbait of the, the third party insurance there right at the end. Um, myself personally, I've never clicked it. Uh, again, I, I, I think that's because I wait until I'm fairly certain myself. Um, I've never had to, to cancel a flight yet, but um, I fully anticipate it might be coming at some point. I want to think a little bit more about the the supply side of these mm-hmm. um, these situations. So, so in your model, and this is super standard. You know, you're you're putting a lot of emphasis in trying to estimate the demand side, get a sense of how the these customers are are varying. You have a very complicated above my pay grade. My pay grade for this podcast is very low. Um, above my pay grade, but you know, you're really focusing on the demand side, but supply side obviously matters. You think about it. Um, and we've touched on it, but I, I, I was hoping you could say a little bit more about what, what is the, so we, we want to discriminate on, you know, willingness to pay kind of in the traditional sense of, of regarding, not worrying about this uncertainty. We're trying to discriminate on, on. Uh, uncertainty. I wonder if you could speculate a little bit more about I don't know, the, the the ways that the other ways that firms try to extract surplus or generate more profit um, that fits into this problem. Like this menu doesn't just fall from the sky; it's chosen by someone. We've talked about why it's it's kind of a weird system of of the quantity set by some people, prices by the others, but you know. Now suppose you wanted you had all the data in the world and you're thinking about the really getting the supply side right. You know, how would you want to specify or lay out that model of of what the uh, what the firm is trying to do? Yeah, I mean, obviously, what we have here is uh, a, a limited capacity, right? That's the first issue that the airline faces is they have a, a flight that's only got X seats on it. Um, at the same time. Consumers are arriving over time. Okay, so this is another thing that they're obviously going to discriminate on is the timing, right? So there's also this evidence that people with high willingness to pay, as I mentioned, they kind of arrive later, right? Like if you really need the ticket um, and you're a week out, you're probably going to be willing to pay a lot more. 
Um, and this is why we see this kind of rationing of these different ticket classes over time. Um, I think obviously all of these things play a tremendous role. The timing of purchase, um, the expected uh, con uh, composition of travelers, how many tickets are left, right? Um, the airline cares a lot about expected demand um, and, and who's going to show up at the end of the, the, the flight, right? Because the last thing they want to do is have someone who's willing to pay $1,000 for a seat and there be no seats left and someone paid $100 for it, right? So obviously if they had perfect foresight, um, you know, they could almost do something similar to like uh, an auction on the last day, right? Take all the consumers that have the highest value and allocate the tickets to them. Um, there are severe problems with this, right? Like you do make travel plans. Like it's more than just your flight. Um, it's your hotel room and everything you want to do, right? Um, which makes that kind of process impossible. Obviously, that would be the first best allocation mechanism in this sense. Um, but, you know, just impossible by the nature of the fact that people are making their decisions at different times. And that's a big aspect of uh, the discrimination that's going on here as well. Well, what I was essentially going to ask are, uh, is about, uh, you know, where do, where do things go from here? What are the questions we need to better understand about airlines and airline pricing? And, um, you know, what, what information uh, is out there that could help us to answer some of these outstanding questions? Yeah, I think uh, part of where we need to be concerned potentially here in the near future is, um, you know, how much information is the airline going to use, like getting into privacy issues, especially because, um, like I mentioned a little bit in this most recent work we're doing with this airline in particular, um, they're thinking about individualized prices and how they can extract all the surplus possible from these consumers. And they're doing this with, you know, your search data, right? Like you enter onto a website and you say, hey, I wanna go from A to B and I have, you know, two kids traveling with me and one adult and, um, you know, maybe I've logged in as a, a frequent flyer for this airline. Um, and then after that, you know, you might be presented a bunch of options and you want the morning flight as opposed to the evening flight, right? Like they have all of that data. And, you know, right now this airline in particular is, is running an experiment, um, which we're kind of helping them with, in which they're taking all of this information um, and potentially targeting consumers for discounts. Um, so, you know, giving them some discount at the very end after they've selected all of these options um, and you might be, be presented with this, hey, this is 20% off um, the ticket price that you just saw on the last page. Do you want to buy or not? Um, and they're thinking about how to get you to buy that ticket. You know, what's it going to take um, given all these characteristics you have? So I think there are some big concerns with, you know, privacy and, and what exactly they're doing with all that information that, that you type in there. One of my first posts was, I think, titled Monopolies Don't Make Enough Money. The whole, whole inefficiency with Monopoly is that they can't do that, right? A first-degree price discriminator is, is perfectly efficient. It's Pareto efficient. That's wonderful. And so I, I'm excited uh, for more of this price discrimination. As you framed it, you know, it, it's a discount. The price discrimination tends to be you're lowering prices for, for people on the margin. Right? Mm -hmm. Sounds wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. I that's mean, my hot, that's my hot take, I guess. I mean, they're trying to fill up the plane, right? Like they would love it if that load factor is 100% every single time. And yeah, there are those people on the margin that they're just, they're going to go after for sure. Well, I, I think that's a nice place to wrap up. Lots of interesting stuff. Look forward to uh, seeing more from, from Garrett and from the whole Ole Miss econ department uh, going forward. We'll put a link in the show notes to Garrett's job market paper. Uh, thanks again, Garrett, for joining us. Thanks. Yep, thanks for having me.